Hello, good afternoon, everyone watching, or good morning, depending on where in the world you are. Welcome to the A4Q World Congress, the first day. I hope you're enjoying it so far. Um, today, we have a very special guest joining us, Stefan Sturm. And I'm just going to give a very quick introduction about Stefan before taking too much of his time. So um, for those that don't know, Stefan Sturm has been in the field of software and system development for almost 30 years. His career path covered current business analysts, requirements engineering, software architect, project lead to, to the definitions of system and development processes to create these systems and much more. I'm sure um, Stefan is going to mention a little bit more about himself later on. I just wanted to give a little bit of a context. For those watching us, I just want to also remind everyone again that this is being live, actually. So if you do have any questions, put them in the comment section down below. And at the end, we might be able to do a very quick and short Q&A for those that have any questions for Stefan to answer as well. Without taking too much of your time, I'm going to pass this on to you. And I'm going to put your presentation on screen now. Thank you, Andrea. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, uh, welcome everybody to my talk at the A4Q World Congress. Uh, being 30 years in the field reminds me how old I am. I'm already 10 years with IREP now. Um, I will be talking about applied requirements engineering, how to increase project success in any project setting. A few words about me up front. Um, as uh, you have been told, my name is Stefan Sturm. I'm the managing director of the IREP GmbH, which is the operating company of the IREP Association. And the IREP Association is a nonprofit organization founded in 2006 by uh, professionals from uh, requirements engineering, from research, from training, from consulting. The goal was to professionalize requirements engineering out in the field. And um, the IREP is the provider of the CPRE scheme, the Certified Professional for Requirements Engineering. I will give you a, few, a bit of information at the end of the talk about the CPRE, uh, what it's all about. Um, as I said, I'm 10 years now. On April 1st, it was 10 years that I'm Managing Director of IREP. Quite an exciting time and uh, spending many time uh, uh, with uh, doing talks on uh, several conferences and um, dealing with all our partners worldwide. So requirements engineering in any uh, project setting. I will be talking about, so sorry, getting back to the overview. I will give you uh, a bit of an in, insight into the challenges in the VUCA world, um, then how to apply requirements engineering, whether plan-driven or agile. Um, we will talk about principles of good requirements engineering, a bit of work products for requirements engineering, what is the outcome, and then um, how to tailor your requirements and the engineering approach, because you need to tailor that one. And then, uh, as I said, I will give you a short introduction on the CPRE and we do a Q&A. IT challenges in the VUCA world. VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Um, I think this is not really new, but uh, today um, it's a bit more um, um, present than we knew that before, because the complexity of systems and the environment is increasing tremendously. We need solid practices and techniques to handle this complexity. There are new competitors in the digital market space. There are new solutions which we did not think about Twitter is already old, Facebook, Netflix, name all these um, 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 digital services. Um, it's, it, we know them for quite a while. Nevertheless, it's new to many players in the field how to deal with such thing, things and how to be innovative to stay ahead. Um, limited time to market for new products. Everything needs to go faster, faster, faster. And for that, we need adaptive and lightweight approaches in order to handle that. And of course, as, as, as in, in the former times, uh, the IT and project budgets are always very tight and we need to work value oriented and in processes and in our product capabilities. So um, there are companies in the field out there have um, different approaches um, to handle that, and but they are doomed to fail because um, 
if you do things in a wrong way when switching to more adaptive and agile approaches, there are plenty of pitfalls. Uh, because way too often there's a missing awareness that shared understanding is still key. I will um, emphasize on that one quite a lot later on. Shared understanding, why do we need that? And if you go to Agile, very often documentation is just skipped, but skipping documentation is not Agile. There's much more to Agile that ju than just that. Um, stakeholders. Still, stakeholders are very important sources for requirements. Um, they they uh, give you their needs. You need to care for stakeholders. You need to identify them. And um, if you outsource development, you need to have proper validation and fast feedback cycles to be successful. All these needs to be kept in mind. And way too often, there's a missing awareness for that. So. This coping or neglecting RE often results in software that does not meet user and stakeholder expectations at all. You need to be aware of that, that requirements engineering is really key to be successful. Um, and the reasons, sorry, this is crap on the slide. The reasons for unclear requirements at all stages of the development are the designers and developers who do not know the actual needs or requirements, so it's not communicated to them. Um, testers who cannot validate the solutions due to missing requirements. Product owners who have lost the overview of existing software capabilities. They simply do not know what is possible today with software. And stakeholders who ask for requirements that are already implemented or are contradicting in just um, already implemented things. So these are challenges you need to handle and to cope with. And whether you are going plan-driven, <coughs> agile, or any other approach with require without requirements, there is no product. And RE is not product process agnostics. So this means even in an adaptive or agile world, requirements still need to be elicited understood, documented, consolidated, and managed, perhaps to a lesser extent than in a classical or brand-driven approach. But that needs to be decided explicitly, not just by um, stepping into a, 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 a whatever process which you cannot handle. You need to think about it and to decide clearly which way to go and how to do. So in our Current brand new CBERI Foundation level version three, we propose to be aware of the fundamental principles of RE. We will uh, cover these principles in a second. Um, that you use appropriate ways of documenting your work products. You will see that there are plenty of ways uh, to document your work products. It's not only writing paper or, or Word documents or whatever tool you use, it's not only prose. It's plenty of things you can do. And you need to scale your requirements engineering approach for your project setup. I will cover these three aspects. The principles of good requirements engineering. So we have identified nine principles. This is the list. Um, I don't go through the list right now because we will touch all the nine of them in the next slides. So this is just a summary. When you download the, the slides later on, you may uh, have the, the full list here. The first principle is that requirements are means to an end. This is value orientation. So this means that you are not rec writing down requirements just to generate thick documents and to be paid by pages. But the value orientation means that there's a trade off how much requirements you specify in order to achieve a certain thing. And there is a simple example how you can do a measure of that, that you say, OK, the impact for missing a requirement is perhaps low, medium, or high. And how is the important is the stakeholder asking for that requirement? And of course, 
if the impact of missing a requirement is high and the stakeholder is a critical one, you are on the top right of the chart, it's a critical requirement to you. So you need to put more effort into that one. This is quite a simple approach. There are different ways of doing that. Okay, so the conclusion is the effort invested into requirements engineering should be inversely proportional to the risk you are willing to take. The more risk you are taking, the lower effort can be done. If you don't want to go any risk in an aircraft or whatever, doing aerospace or whatever, medical devices, you need to put more effort into the requirements. So this is value orientation, no waste. The second principle is, RE is about satisfying stakeholders. The goal of building a system that a new system solves problem to potential users. So um, stakeholders are still key, and that might be persons or you see that as a persona, this is a certain concept, concept, but you need to care for the stakeholders. It's very important identifying the right stakeholders. Involving the right people in the relevant stakeholder roles is crucial for successful RE. If you're talking to the wrong people, everything is lost. You will not be successful. So how to identify stakeholders is a very important task within uh, requirement engineering. The third principle, good solutions are impossible without shared understanding. That's what I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, you all know probably this cartoon with the swing construction where two persons have a swing in mind, but in totally different pictures. And of course, there's no shared understanding. And Requirements engineering creates, fosters, and secures shared understanding between stakeholders, involved parties. Now we talk about explicit and implicit shared understanding. Explicit means um, this is um, achieved through elicitation, documenting, and agreeing on requirements engineering. This is typically the goal of requirements in plan-driven processes. And implicit shared understanding, it is more based on shared knowledge about needs, vision, context, and so on. And this is typically what you try to achieve in an agile um, context. So the conclusion is proven practices for achieving shared understanding include working with glossaries. This is more an explicit thing. Prototype is as well something explicit minimal viable product or using existing systems as references. These are more explicit, th explicit things, but um, as well, based on knowledge, needs, visions, context is, is as well a shared understanding, which is then an implicit shared understanding. Things can only be understood in context. Um, when you're starting with any issue or challenge problem to solve or improve, then you need to take care about the context. And there is the system context, which is everything that has a direct impact on your existing system, on your users, operations. These are, these are all in the, in the system context. And there's a broader context, which is everything a bit more outside, but nevertheless having some impact on your system and an indirect impact like regulations, laws, or certain user groups who receive results from your system. And typically, RE is looking at the system context um, more precise. But nevertheless, if outside context changes, this might, might have an uh, impact on the system context with as then a, an impact on your system again. So the essence is that the scope which you need to look at can go beyond the requirements for your system and the interfaces at the system boundary. The requirements engineering must deal as well with the phenomena in the system context and perhaps even a bit outside in the context even there is an influence on your system context. But you need to be sure to understand where the influence factors on your systems are located. So working on the context and understanding the context is very, very important. So an example might be that you are in a certain domain and there are 
domain regulations or whatever the domain specific uh, typical things which you need to be aware of, which are in the context, but they have an influence on the system you are working on. So the next one is um, that problems, requirements, and solutions are intertwined. If you look from a classical perspective, typically on the left-hand side, you have a problem. And for the problem, you collect the needs, the requirements, which define then the solution, and the solution shall solve a problem. So this is related to each other. In a more innovative um, um, scenario, very often people come along not with a problem, but just with a solution, solution which is an idea. I do have an idea. I want to, um, to offer something to the customers out there uh, where they can send out tweets. And then um, there was no problem to that. They just had an idea. So they defined some requirements about that and defined the needs and said, okay, um, this is how we implement this solution. And out of a sudden, they solved the not non-existing problem, which was how can we communicate in fast uh, time, in, in real time? How can we interact? So there was no problem. So this is innovation. So nevertheless, the problem the needs, requirements, and the solutions are intertwined. They have influence on each other. Requirements engineers strive for separating the requirements concerns from the solution concerns. So typically, they try to um, specify requirements without um, targeting a certain solution. Um, this is a basic principle. Some, the more you, you work towards the solution, the less you can uh, really um, separate these concerns. But in this beginning, you can, can really try to separate the requirements from a targeted solution in order to choose from different pos potential solutions afterwards. The sixth principle is uh, validation is key, the sooner the better, um, because you need to check whether your context assumptions are reasonable. Uh, principle number four, whether you really are covering the desires and needs of your stakeholders to, to do you really address the, 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 these things correct, the principle number two, and that you reach an agreement on that. And validation just means to verify, sorry, pressing the wrong key, is that the validation is the process of confirming that the documented requirements match the stakeholder needs. And there are different ways of documenting these things and to validate that. You can do reviews or walkthroughs, or you can build simple, easy prototypes or mockups. So this is not only one way to do that. There are several ways to do that. But the sooner you do that, the better. This uh, um, um, links uh, directly to the agile uh, principle of fast feedback. Principle number seven, which um, is a bit uh, untypical for um, traditionals, um, traditional requirement engineers, which means changes are no accident. In, uh, in former times, we wanted to avoid change, but today change is welcome. And um, there are many ways of um, how requirements engineering can support you in um, dealing with change. Um, this might appear in elicitation, validation, or creating agreement that things need to be changed. But in requirements management, we have lots of, um, of possibilities to deal with this change um, by doing baselines, for example. And the backlog item, by the way, is nothing else than a formal change request you can put into the backlog items. Of course, not all items that there are change requests, but you can put change requests, for example, in the backlog item. And the way to to specify these changes and um, to, to, to specify what you want to change, this is done with requirements engineering. But change is welcome in requirements engineering as well. And requirements engineers need to manage this change, so the evolution of requirements. Otherwise, they will not be able to, to manage them anymore, and they will be remote controlled by the, by the changes. So they will be pushed and, 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 and driven by the changes. So actively managing change is a core task of requirements engineering. Principle number eight. You need to encourage innovation. More of the same is not enough. This means um, just um, um, 
copying and adapting the requirements, documents or artifacts from the previous project is not innovative. Um, the good requirements engineer is aware of technical innovation so that uh, the capabilities of software or hardware is uh, is improving all the time and they try to uh, <coughs> excuse me to use these innovation uh, to to use this um, um, enhanced capabilities to to build innovative um, products or systems and uh, therefore they will find good solutions for a prob problem and they may investigate other domains to to look for ideas how have things been uh, solved there and what can they learn and adapt from it and requirements engineers this is uh, something which looks trivial but is it, it isn't are not voice recorders or secretaries very often requirements engineers are regarded to somebody who simply notes and records what uh, stakeholders are telling them but uh, requirements engineers are analyzing these things and are looking for good um, requirements and solutions in the end on the other hand they will not, never be smarter like so to know everything better is as well not uh, a good attitude for a requirements engineer so the good requirements engineers go beyond of what stakeholders tell them. They make stakeholders feel happy, excited, and safe. So they will um, come, uh, come up with a, a solution which is really exciting. Nevertheless, in the end, requirements engineering is a systematic and disciplined work. This means that requirements engineers configure an RE process that is well suited for the problem they are targeting. Uh, and this has a lot of influence and factors. Um, the development process chosen for the system, it has an influence on that. The complexity and criticality of the system to, de de to be deployed, um, the degree to which stakeholders can express their needs. Sometimes they are not able to express their needs, so you need to find different approaches. Um, then the question, how much shared understanding is, is available? Uh, the project type, um, the constraints to the system and to the, to the solution, how much time and budget is available, availability of stakeholders, volatility of the requirements. Um, so all this has an influence on your RE process and a good RE requirements engineer is able to shape the RE process accordingly. And just saying we are agile and flexible are no excuses, no valid excuses for unsystematic and ad hoc style work in RE. Now, even if you are agile and flexible, you can do it systematically and discipline. And that's what I'm showing you with the work products for requirements and um, the, um, the documentation. So here's a whole bunch of potential work products for requirements, user stories, use cases, graphical things, products, print, backlog, prototypes, story maps. All these are work products which are results of requirements engineering. In Agile, very often you use themes, epics, user stories, tasks, and so on. Classical RE often uses use cases, specification models. You do not need all of them. You select the best for your project setting. And before documenting your requirements, it is helpful to select the, the right word products for the right purpose. Sorry, I'm struggling with the words now. Okay, be aware that you choose the right things out of these potential things. And when selecting a work product, you need to be aware that the work product has a purpose, that there is a um, intended audience, a specific audience for this work product, and that the work product has a lifetime. For example, the purpose, it's for increasing shared understanding, creating shared understanding, create, a, create agreement if you want to reach agreement with people, or if you want to validate something, then these are different um, purposes of a work product. In the audience, you will find different interests. So you might need different views on, uh, on, on your requirements to, to, prov uh, to provide the interesting things to the, to the audience. The people will have different skills. So you might need different notations or, or um, ways to present your work product. 
and the, the people will have different roles. So they will ask for different level of details. So these are all aspects which you need to be aware of when selecting the work product you are creating, whether you're doing a prototype or simply a specification. And there's a lifetime of, uh, of such work products. Sometimes they are temporary. So it's only to create support and support communication and to create shared understanding. And afterwards, you don't need it anymore. Or it's evolving that it grows over several iterations over time, like user stories. And um, sometimes they have even metadata to attach to it. Or it's durable work products, um, like a glossary, which you really implement and then serves as your pro uh, project glossary all over the project. So excuse me. there's a lifetime. And all this has an impact on the work product which you select. You need to tailor your approach, RE approach. There are so many different software development approaches out there. The requirements engineering approach must fit to them. So there's no one size fits all RE process. You cannot say we done it, we have done it that way the last time, we do it again. You need to have a look on the development process which you have chosen for the system to create. You need to look at the complexity and the criticality of the system which you are developing. You need to have um, an, a clear uh, understanding uh, whether stakeholders can clearly express their needs or whether you need to different uh, elicitation process, um, approaches to, to collect their, their requirements. Um, the constraints, all these things which I mentioned before are influencing factors on tailoring your RE process. And when you think about tailoring an RE process, it says at least three facets need to be considered. This is the time facet, whether you ask yourself, is the development approach rather linear or is it iterative? The purpose, is the purpose of the requirements rather fixed, so prescriptive, or is it rather open, explorative, so that it can evolve? And the target facet, is the product to be created rather customer specific or is it more market oriented? So being a standard product. And these things have an impact on the requirement engineering process. I will get back to that in a second. So these are bits of good and uh, solid requirements engineering. In the CPRE, we cover that in the foundation level at the very bottom where you can go for without uh, any prerequisites. We have an introduction on requirements and uh, on agile, uh, where how to, to do requirements engineering in agile, but this is an introduction only. It's not hands-on in depth. On top of that, we uh, offer a couple of advanced level modules as well here and RE at Agile, which is the hands-on in-depth um, thing on how to do requirements engineering in Agile. And on top of that, we've got an expert level, which is for the expert level, uh, experts only, as the name says, which is uh, not um, really interesting at that point in time. I'm more talking about the, 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 the two um, levels here. Uh, at the bottom and in the middle. This is the most important education in RE worldwide currently. And here is the uh, table of contents of our current syllabus uh, where we give an introduction of requirements engineering. We talk about the fundamental principles, the mine, which I have just introduced more in depth, of course. We give you all potential work products and documentation practices. Um, we talk about how to elaborate, how to elicit, how to, um, to shape requirements. And we talk about how to tailor your RE process in EU5. And of course, a, a bit about management, um, handling change, doing baselines, um, having releases, having life cycles of requirements. And a bit of, about tool support. Um, a few words about the exam in the Agile Primer, which is the introduction which I mentioned. There are two ways to go. There's a certification exam, 
with about 22 questions, a multiple choice test, 45 minutes, and you receive a certificate, or there's an online self-assessment, which is available on the IREP website, which is not ending up in a certificate, but just in a, cert, uh, in, in a um, confirmation of successful completion. In our foundation level as well, there's a multiple choice test, um, about 45 questions, 75 minutes. You need to have 70% of the total points to reach. We have uh, certified about uh, 60,000 people worldwide, meanwhile, in the foundation level. And in the advanced level, there is a two-part exam. The first part is a multiple choice test, similar to the foundation level, but of course, in the dedicated advanced level. And there is a written assignment. The written assignment within one year is not one year of effort. It's about two days of effort, but we want to give you enough time to implement what you have learned for the multiple choice test. This is a lot of theory which you have learned and then you shall apply that in your daily job. And once you feel capable and, 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 and safe with all the techniques and methods, you may go for the written assignment. So it's not two, one year of work, it's just two days approximately, but you will have one year to get at this experience up front. And each advanced level module has its own exam and certificate. And there we will touch all the things which I have uh, presented in my talk before. Of course, in the foundation level, we cover all of that, but only to a certain level of detail, of course. And in the advanced levels, we, give more, we, go, we go more in depth in each um, specific area. So this is the end of my talk for today. And I hope that we still got time for a few questions. Back to Andrea at this point. You're muted still, Andrea. My apologies. Um, now, yes, I hope you can hear me now. Um, such an interesting presentation. Thank you so much, Stefan. So I've got a couple of comments here on the group saying thank you so much. Very interesting. Um, we have a few people in the groups asking if you are also going to be in the Congress Hall area. Yeah, I will be there. So um, I, I do have a, a booth there and I will man the booth uh, right after our talk. Um, I will be there for an hour or so. Perfect. So um, for those people asking, if you go to that link, I also already shared that in the comments section, head to the booth and you will be able to see Stefan there as well after the presentation. Um, we also had a question earlier, but um, let's have a look if I can find it. Um, we had Devendra Kermi. Um, so I can see I just wanted to know about automation tests and tools, Selenium WebDriver. Oh, I wonder. I in, the wrong, in the wrong talk. I, I was going to say, I think you might be in the wrong talk. <laughs> <laughs> the Vedra, but this one will be about IREP. Um, so I hope you still found it quite interesting. We have a few other comments coming up. We have here Gloriella V. Jeda saying, Great talk from Facebook. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, so, yeah, such a great one. And I can see any questions. Just let us know right now if you have any. And otherwise, if you do want to speak um, with Stefan a little bit more, as he mentioned, he's going to be in the Congress Hall area section, so you can discuss a little bit more as well. Yeah, there's a there's an IREP uh, booth where I will be, and um, just get um, meet me there, and uh, we can talk directly. Lovely. Are you going to be there um, just today, or any other uh, days of the Congress as uh, well? No, I will be just there today after after the talk. Now, for I, I think about uh, for one and a half hour or something like that. Perfect. No problem. So I'm going to have a look. I can see another comment coming just here. One second. Um, in the groups, they are asking for your slideshows. Yeah, I will. I will uh, hand over the slideshows to the organizers, and then uh, you can download. I'm not sure how you how you organize that in the A4Q, but um, I, I will uh, make the slideshow available. Okay, no okay, problem. No oh, my mic seems to be sounding a little bit. <laughs> there you go. So we have Theodore asking, can you elaborate a bit about requirements in Agile? Um. Yes, in, in fact, in Agile, um, very often uh, the, the teams start uh, pretty soon on the development, of course, on the minimal viable products, and uh, this is this is okay. But uh, you need to 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 nevertheless for that parts which are you working on, you need to have requirements. So what you typically typically are doing, you start with an epic or with a vision, 
and there you have a broad view on it. And then you decide to um, develop a certain bit at the very first stage. So for this bit, you need then to look for more detailed requirements. This means um, that on the beginning, you have the requirements on a more abstract level and on a, on, on a course, um, what is? <laughs> Coarse grained, I think is the right uh, English term, so right, right a rough specified. And the more approach to implementing a specific thing, the more fine grained you need to be, the more precise you need to describe an interface, for example, or a user um, interface, or uh, the data you want to store, the data types you want to store, and as, as well the, the, the functionality and the features. So this means you start off with a rough abstract level. And the more you proceed, you the more detailed you be. And this means that in an iterative process, you are um, growing your requirement space, not having a big specification in the beginning, as in former times, but becoming more bigger and bigger the, the, the more you advance. Yeah, this is something you can do in, in Azure. By the way, have a look at our website, irep.org. You see the link in my back side, back, and um, there is a download section, and we provide everything for free for download. So if you are looking for the RE at Agile stuff, um, there is a handbook available. The syllabus gives you the learning objectives. But the handbook gives you the full implementation. So even for self-study, you can download the handbook, check it out, read through it, and you will get valuable information on how to handle requirements um, in an Agile context. And by the way, for the foundation level, there's a handbook as well. So you can get the uh, see the requirements engineering basics by going through the foundation level handbook and then the specific uh, Agile things in, in the Agile handbook. Thank you. So I just put the irep.org link on screen as well, so people can see it a little bit more clearly. And we also have here another question. So we can see also Debbie saying super Stefan as always. Yeah. Um, we have also here Michael um, yeah. Gubrecht. Um, yeah. What is the best way to cover requirements by test cases? In, in fact, test cases are kind of requirements. You know, very often you 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 um, see out in the field the testers are asked to write test cases without having any requirements. And then they say, okay, what is the requirement um, where I can test against? And this means when um, when working on the on the features and, and the requirements, you need to think about test cases, which then can prove what the requirements. So this is a kind of validating your requirements as well. So you should not work on the test cases after finishing the development but already when specifying the features and the requirements, you should as well already start with um, specifying your test cases. And this fits as well to test-driven development and, and, and all this stuff where you say, hey, we need to know how to test and the test is a part of our next, next sprint. This means requirements and testing are that close to each other. And for that reason, I'm, I'm talking as well or very often on, on tester conferences because the testers very often feel the, face the situation that requirements are missing and this is not, not working. You know, Test and requirements go hand in hand. When you specify the requirements, think about the test cases at the same time and get the testers involved in that. Um, thank you so much for that. I hope that answers your question, Michael. Um, I think, oh, I can hear my voice double. I hope your audio from your side is okay. Um, uh, lovely. Um, so I'm, we're running out of time now. So if you do have any other questions for Stefan, um, please go to the Congress Hall area and then you can in that way discuss with him as well. He will be there, as he mentioned, for the next probably hour or so after this pre um, Congress, this conference is over. So head over there and also we're going to have two other uh, presentations coming up in about 20 minutes. So also stay tuned for those. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Stefan. Very very interesting. Um, I put the link in the um, screen so everyone can see of irep.org. And any other questions? Go to the Congress the Hall. The, for the Congress Hall as well on the screen, are you able to do that? That they people know the the link to the Congress Hall that I can. Yes. I have it over here. The only thing is that because it's quite long, it might be a bit difficult to type it, but I have put it in the comment section so people actually are able to click on it and go there directly. 
Um, we have one last question before we run too much of time from Dennis. He says, Dennis, is it's invalid to create test matrix to clarify the test requirements? For, for sure. Um, so I think it's quite difficult to test the requirements with the test matrix, but um, at least you can identify it that at least um, each requirement is covered by the test because um, if you have requirements which are not covered by the test, how do you know whether they are implemented in the, in the right way, you know? Um, so um, it's not about checking the requirements, but to ensure that in the end there is a test related to the requirements, okay? Thank you for that. So yes, we're running out of time now, but I'm also putting um, the link also on screen so you can see it. And it's also in the comment section. So you can go over there and speak a little bit more with Stefan. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today and take care and have a good day. Bye-bye, Andrea. Bye.